All right. <clears throat> so God's under rowers. Has anybody ever heard the phrase under rower before? <laughs> me neither. Before this last weekend, which was really kind of crazy for me. Um, so we're going to jump right in here. This is for week four, day one. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. So one of the things that's going to happen at the end of chapter 4, Paul is going to tell the Corinthians that they need to imitate him. That he is like a father to them in their faith. And they should look at him in his life and his response to Christ's call. And he's going to tell them, you should imitate me. The way I have responded to the gospel is the way you should respond to the gospel. And so when we, we look back through chapter 4 through that lens, one of the first things he does is he says, this is how you should think about us. Just like we talked a little bit last week about your purpose and your identity uh, being tied to you belong to God. Uh, Paul is saying, when you think about me and you think about my purpose and my identity, this is how you should do it. You should think of me as a servant of Christ and a faithful steward of the mysteries of God. Now, on first blush at this, right... I'm going to deal with faithful stewards briefly first. A steward is simply a person who has been given uh, possession of something for a temporary amount of time. And there to, uh, to be a faithful steward is to do right by the giver with whatever they've given you. So if it's a, a job, a faithful steward is somebody who fulfills their role in their, in their job position. In the Bible, some of the parables Jesus shared were of kind of toward Israel, talking about how God is this owner of this land and he has leased it to certain people and they're stewards over that land for a certain amount of time. But he's going to come back at harvest time, and he's going to take what belongs to him and that sort of thing. And, and so that language is throughout Old and New Testament about stewardship. But the essence of it is you don't own anything. And really, when we ultimately look at this life, like we could look at, look at Dave's place and what he has and he has possessions and different things, but he's really just a steward because, you know, Dave's in pretty good shape. I know he works out, but he's probably got at best 40 more years or so on the face of the earth. And then all of his stuff is going to go to somebody else. It's, he can't take any of it with him. So he's a steward the time, this period of time that he has in his life, he's a steward. He's been given some things, and God says you're going to give an account for what you've been given. Some people who have been given a lot, a lot's required of it. No problem. That's probably the Lord. <laughs> um, what's funny, we have... Demanding. Just, just, right now. just as a little side note, and I hope this doesn't throw us off, we have a number of people who come... On Sunday morning, we minister to some kind of fringe people, and we go into a an assisted living situation, but it's more for people who have some mental disorders. And more times uh, than a handful, a phone has gone off during the service, and I'm teaching like this, and they're having a phone conversation while I'm, while I'm trying to teach. I'm like, you can go ahead and step out in the hall if you want, if you need to stay on that phone call. It's, Kind of funny. So, yeah, that's not the worst thing that's ever happened to us teaching. But a steward's not an owner. You don't own anything. It's been given. And when you're done, it's going to be given to somebody else. Okay. And, and so Paul recognizes that they are stewards of the mysteries of God. But then he says that they're servants of Christ. Almost 
unanimously in Paul's writings, when he says servant, he uses the word doulos, all right, which is like a slave. And uh, so I, I don't know what the word count difference is between doulos and the word that we're getting ready to look at, but I've been looking into the original language in for in, in the Greek New Testament pretty solidly for about 10 years. And this is the first time I've ran across this word. Every time I've ever seen servant, I've always just thought he's using the word doulos. But he's not in this context. He's using a word, uh, hupertes, which are, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, that was that was my um, Hispanic version, but that's not the, the way they say it in Greek. But it literally means under rowers. All right? So... Um, for us, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but for everybody in Corinth, so this is a map of Corinth in Greece around the time that Paul is writing, and you can see uh, how this, the sea comes up into here, and there's this <coughs> isthmus channel, or, or um, isthmus peninsula type of land mass that crosses over here, and what cargo ships and, uh, sh you know, kind of ships for hire would do is they would they would boat into here okay and then they would carry their cargo and their ship or they would have two ships and they would carry it across this little bit of land and then they would get on another boat and take it out here and it would save them from having to go all the way around all right so paul uses this word under rower and it's it's a literally a technical term for a slave who spent their life in the belly of a commercial trade ship, and they rode. So they either had wind propulsion or they were propelled by oars. Some of these ships would have, sometimes if they were a bigger one, they would have three rows of oars, sometimes 15 or 20 on each side, three rows deep, and these oars were 30 plus feet long. So I'm guessing, what are we looking at, Dave? 20, 25 here from me to you. So an oar longer than the distance from here to that wall. So you can imagine the life of a person, and, and oftentimes they had two or three people on one oar, all right? And they had shackles on their ankles, and the uh, they were chained to the boat. So they used the restroom there. Imagine being on the bottom of the three rows and that's where they spent their life. And they were they were slaves. They were under rowers. All right? So there's <clears throat> five aspects of being an under rower that I found this paper by a guy named John Bow and he he wrote about the the under rowers, and he he points out five aspects of under rowers that are helpful in creating this image of how Paul thought about his ministry and how he wanted the Corinthians to think about his purpose and his identity as it related to being an under rower for Christ. The first is that the galley slave rowed to the captain's beat. So, in order to keep as many as 150 oars together, a rhythmic beat was sounded on a drum by the rowing mate. Each slave in the galley had to pull on their oar in time with the beat. So, they they the way they did that, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but they had a guy that would, to a certain beat on the drum, and every one of them, would move to the beat. They knew, they understood the beat, and they all kept time. And so they had to trust the captain in the beat of the drum. The second thing is that they had to row together. On a larger craft, the oars were up to 30 feet in length and were pulled by up to three rowers per oar. The galley slave quickly learned that one could not lean on the oar, another push, and another pull. They had to work as a team. So you get the image. If, if Dave 
and myself and Dan, well, probably Dave and Dan could handle it without me, but I could put my arms on there and act like I was doing the work. But if, if Dan's pulling and Dave's pushing and I'm leaning on the oar, we're not getting it done, right? We've all got to be in motion, right? You, you uh, push down, uh, you push down, get the thing uh, in the air, you pull up through the water and then you push down and through and we're all doing this together. Now imagine that's on one oar. Imagine 150 oars. Okay. So not only does each team on each oar have to do it, but you can't have your oars banging together on the outside of the boat. Right. They all have to be going same speed, the same direction to the beat. Right. Now, these are images that if we think about life or we think about the church, right, and how Paul's wanting uh, the Corinthians to think about him, later he's going to say you need to imitate me, you need to be like me, you need to think of yourself as an under rower for God. But one of the things that was happening in Corinth was some of the Corinthians were saying, I'm of Paul. Some of the Corinthians were saying, I'm of Apollos. Some were saying, I'm of Christ. And in effect, they were all oaring in different directions. They're, they weren't going in the same direction. They weren't heading the same way. And even if you think about a marriage, how difficult it can be if one spouse is going one direction, another spouse is going the other direction. How much conflict can happen there? And, and God's called us. His call is strong enough on us that he says, everybody can come together and follow my beat. Follow the one direction that I'm giving. It's the, it's the meta narrative. It's the meta story of God. The third thing, they had to trust the captain. <clears throat> In the gloomy depths of the boat, a slave had no idea where he was, where he was going, or the time of arrival. The life of the rower was one of total faith and obedience. As the captain's beat grew more and more rapid, it might signal an impending enemy attack, a storm to be avoided, or a hurried schedule. The slave was not allowed to question which. His job was only to obey the beat of the captain's drum and row. Okay, Whatever God's calling us to do is what we go to do. We don't question why. Fourth, the galley slave was committed for life. His was always a one-way trip. The damp, hard benches were no relief to his weary bones after a day's labor. Comfort was not a concern, and the leg chains bound every slave to the ship with deadly certainty. And if the ship went down in a storm or in a conflict, the slaves were tied to the fate of the ship with no way of escape. Now, if you think about Paul and the church, part of what he was saying to them, this Corinthian church that was full of all kinds of sin and worldliness, he's like, I'm bound to this ship. If this ship goes down, I'm going down with it. All right? And that's how you should view me as a, uh, Paul is saying, my relationship to God and my relationship to you. Right? This ship goes down, I'm going down with it. It's pretty cool. The red red. Hey, Brian. Do you think the uh, term underwear came from the under rowers since there was three levels? That was just a stupid joke. I was thinking. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, to like catch it, the whole term, why is it underwear? Anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to say to that. Okay. <laughs> um, finally, the slaves received no honor. Only the captain of the vessel was visible to the outer world. Uh, although there were many men who gave their lives and very breath to keep the ship going, they were never seen. They rode on and on, day in and day out, invisible to and unrewarded by the world. If an under rower was ever seen, it was because he was not doing his job. And <clears throat> there's a number of spiritual implications to that one is that 
we all were born into a culture. Well, not only, we are, we already have this sin nature where we are consumed with self, think about ourselves constantly, but we live in America where that is not something that is seen as negative, but we kind of champion that. And we want the world to always be about us. All of the marketing techniques, it's all about you, making the most of you, that sort of thing. And when we meet Christ, we at some point, usually early on, we recognize that it's all about Him. That when God created the universe, He didn't set us in the middle of it and have everything revolve around us. Soon we learn not only could we not ultimately hold up to that, but that it's right for Christ to be in that place and for Him to receive the honor and the glory. And uh, I think about the story, the night of the Last Supper, the night before Jesus is going to the cross, and two of his buddies are arguing over who's going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. And they're like, tell us, who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? And I, on this side, look at him and be like, stupid, it's his kingdom. He's going to be the greatest in his kingdom. It's not going to be you, all right? And so we have to get over ourselves. And Paul is saying, look, I'm there. And this is the same kind of attitude that you should have. Uh, you're going to imitate me, Paul says. One other thing, this is an abbreviated version of the teaching that I did on Sunday. But in week four, day three, which is 1 Corinthians 4, 9 to 13, Paul is on his way. Uh, first of all, I would just say, when he, when he said, you should consider us as under rowers for Christ, a whole bunch of Corinthians didn't stand up and be like, I want to be that guy. Like nobody did. Nobody stood up and said, that, that is definitely a term and a word picture and a reality that they would most definitely spend their lives trying to avoid, right? If you end up there, something went terribly wrong in your life. And Paul is saying, I, I am willingly shackling myself to Christ. I am willingly shackling myself to this church, to you, okay? And, uh, and so there, there is, there is uh, something going on there that's quite remarkable. Uh, Paul is going to compare himself uh, to the Corinthians in this passage. He says, I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ." We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. That sounds like the life of an under rower, mm -hmm. right? A glad one, anyway, right? Uh, when, when all of these negative things are happening, they're responding. Now, here's the thing. Paul is, <laughs> is saying to them, uh, I am I'm the one who planted this church and established this church. And I established it on the cross, right? And... In the first chapter, he talked about the cross. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness uh, to those who are headed for destruction. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, uh, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. God shows things the world considers foolish, in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. 
God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. So this is how Paul starts 1 Corinthians. The cross is this thing that when the outside world looks at it, they see it as weakness and foolishness. And uh, But it's really the wisdom and the power of God. When he goes and he's saying, now let's take a look at how you're doing. And he, he is literally in this paragraph, he's saying from the perspective of the watching world, from the perspective of the unregenerate non-believer. He's saying, to, to them, we look like we're weak, but you look strong. We look fool. We look like fools to them, but you are held in honor. And basically what he's saying is you guys have abandoned the cross. You guys have taken the culture and tried to get the best of both worlds. You want to claim the cross, but you don't want to look foolish before the world. You want to claim the cross, but you don't want to look like you're weak in front of the world. And so you understand what the world wants, and somewhere between here and here, you lose the message of the cross. And you're not the way you should be. You're just not. Uh, I, I, I really like... I mean, there's so much in here, right? All this weakness, all of this, we look foolishness. He's saying, look, we're people of the cross. We're there. That's who we are. All right? I like that he says, um, to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. Right? For, you know, anybody ever heard the phrase hungering and thirsting anywhere else in the New Testament? Right? The Sermon on the Mount. One of the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they shall be satisfied. And so Paul has kind of put that in there. And for the, for the one who studies, that's a little gem. He's saying, look, for the outside world, we look like this, but what we're hungering and thirsting for is righteousness. So the, the, the reality is, we're the only ones who are satisfied. Okay? We're the only ones. Nobody else here is. Only, only those who are hungering and thirsting and choosing to deny themselves, to, to accept the image of a galley slave for Christ. <clears throat> and then finally, this is, this is how he ends it. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. And imitate is just a readiness to take up the same way of life and full commitments to Christ. And when I think about this, there's, there's a level of confidence that Paul has. I mean, when you're, when, uh, so like I have a brother-in-law that has this ski boat and he teaches people how to wakeboard. And you might show somebody, it's like, imitate what this person's doing, see how they're holding the rope, see how they're bending their knees, see when they come up out of the water and you can imitate them. And that's, there's not a lot of consequence if you don't imitate that person that way. If you never get up on a wakeboard, you're like, eh, you know, not that big of a deal. But when you begin to deal with the issues of God and mankind's relationship <laughs> to him, you leave sort of a realm of responsibility that is earthly and temporary, and you enter one that is eternal. Okay? Paul is talking about them having eternal life. He's telling them, if you imitate me, you will be on the path that leads to the greatest joy 
eternal life, and it is exactly what God would have you to do in your life. That's what he's saying. And on one side, it's like, no, no one who really understands that statement would ever make it lightly, right? If you throw that around, you don't really understand what you're saying. Uh, and so it's sort of like this thing that I think few people would, would tell somebody. But Paul very boldly and confidently says, you imitate me. He's actually going to do that several times in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 11, he's going to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Other places in the New Testament say, imitate your elders. Imitate the people of faith in your community. And so there is this call to follow people of faith in a certain way. And so my takeaway, my takeaway from this is I think that we can learn a lot about the community and the church from the image of an under rower. And how vitally important it is for us all to be going the same direction, to have the same goals, glorify God, seek to win people to Christ, move from being immature in Christ to being mature in Christ. Uh, all of the things that Jesus taught, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but, but seeing this in all of us moving in the same direction, championing Jesus Christ and Him crucified as the cornerstone of the foundation of all reality, right? Everybody moved in that same direction. But the other side of it, I believe that one of the greatest places you can come to in your faith, and in my faith, is to, with, with certainty, be able to tell people, imitate me you will respond in your life to God the way I have responded to God in my life, you will be on the right path. You will be on the path that God wants for you if you imitate me. And I would, at this point, like in my devotions and in the way I think about this, is like, okay, Lord, what is in my life that should not be imitated? What is going on that I could not tell people, imitate this? All right? I explained last week how I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit has known ultimately since before the foundations of the earth that we would be studying these passages on becoming spiritually mature. And he knows that it's coming and it's here and it's now. And I am convinced that if you will go to him and you will say, Lord, um, what is in my life that should not be imitated? Uh, is it what's going on? Uh, one of the things he does earlier in chapter four is he says, God judges the intentions of our hearts. He's going to shine a light into the corners of our hearts. And he is not only is he going to do that, but he's going to reveal, he's going to disclose the motivations of our hearts. Okay? That's the level at which we should be asking God, is there anything even in my heart, a motivation that is driving me that should not be imitated on the path to follow you? And... On one end, there's sort of like a wholesale repentance. That if you were to look at your life and somebody came to you and said, I want Jesus and I want to know how to follow Jesus, you'd be like, don't look at me. Okay? And there's kind of a wholesale repentance. But I do believe the way we get there, the way we get to where we're supposed to be, is one thing at a time. Literally one day at a time. And so today... Asking the Lord, Lord, uh, that if there is one thing in my life that is not worth imitating, what is it? And I am convinced, because of who God is, that he will supernaturally and powerfully deliver you from that, make that no longer a part of your life. And he's going to do that 
now. He can do that today, this week, through this study. Okay? And so I would just want to encourage you guys. I'm just going to have a quick time of, of prayer, and I'm going to have a little bit of time of just silence in here. And I want to encourage every person, think about what that is. You know, one of the realities is 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 uh, this is a this is Paul's talking to people who are believers who have made the commitment who have said I have seen enough in Christ and what's going on around me it's time for me to give my life to him that may be your thing here tonight okay and so uh, I'm gonna pray we'll have that little bit of a period of silence you ask God, what is it? Make a mental note of it. If you have to write it down, write it down. If it's something you need to confess to somebody else, um, grab me, grab Cass, grab Dave, grab whoever you need to. Say, look, this is a sin in my life that I need to be free from. I have lived as a slave to it for too long. And I am ready to be delivered now. Okay? I, it is tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. I thank you for your word. I know that, that Paul is going to talk about all kinds of sin. He's going to be naming sin over the next few weeks. And here tonight, Lord, before we get there, um, as your spirit moves and reveals each person's need, I pray that the one uh, that or any that need salvation, Lord, would take this time right now to surrender their life to you, to place their faith and trust in you, and to live the rest of their lives by faith in you. <coughs> For uh, anyone else here, Lord, that is serious about your word and your kingdom, the gospel, Lord, we all come to you with a myriad of of things in our lives that are not worth imitating. And I just pray here tonight, right now, you would reveal what you want to free us from, each of us individually. What is that right now, Lord? Holy Spirit, what is it? Lord, now I know that there is nothing that compares to knowing you and to uh, seeing you in your glory and having you heal us and make us new. And so I just pray right now that you would deliver us from this sin, that you would wash us and cleanse us and justify us in your sight because of faith, because of your grace. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I would tell you guys, <clears throat> I've been kind of pressing th into this and praying through this, and Cassie can kind of testify to what's been going on with me in the last couple days. Sometimes when God's doing this, I think about it as sort of spiritual, uh, you're on the operating table spiritually, and that can be a painful process. And you may come to a point where you just need to know. You need to know in, this, in that point that whatever he is trying to purify, whatever work he's trying to do to you, right now it may be painful or uh, insecure. It may feel scary. But uh, hang on. The worst parts of the scary usually only last a day or two. And what he produces on the other side so much outweighs where you're at right now. Mm. So I just want to encourage you guys. When you, if you sense that something's not right, something's going on, he could be doing spiritual kind of cleansing operation on you. And just go into prayer. You know, get you some space from the people around you. But, but know that the other side is so much better. And the 
God giving himself to us this way is an incredible, incredible joy and privilege. So I just want to encourage you guys, if, if you go there, because I've been there the last couple of days, I know that that is how he does it for me. And, um, but I, I know that the glory, his glory revealed on the other side is worth it. And uh, for me, it's really a letting go of some things. So, all right. Well, that's it for tonight, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And, uh, man, God bless you. And go Royals. Yeah. Trying to get behind. Brian, I'm trying to get a. Uh, I have four.